Hello and welcome to another episode of the DJ Project Criterion Collection. And here we're going to talk about Spine 342, Eric Romer's Six Moral Tales. As you can tell, this is a big one. And by the way, this is also the when they started to use the new packaging where you have the little C on the corner. So, while this is a big one, hopefully it, it won't be too extensive. Yes, there are six films in it. I'm not going to talk about all of them, and but actually you'll, you'll come to understand why. Uh, first, let me talk a little bit about Eric Romer. Um, Eric Romer, and this was, and this is the only thing that I've seen of his. Um, Eric Romer, um, after seeing this set and getting into the films, um, he's, he inadvertently became, um, and slightly more after the fact, but he became a cinematic godfather to a project where I've, I've written the scripts and I'm in the, I'm trying to get them made and then in turn direct. It's a series of films called The Relationship Triptych. I think I've mentioned this before. Um, now there's a reason why Eric Romer uh, serves as a cinematic godfather is what I got from The Six Moral Tales and what I learned from Romer. Again, I know he's done a lot more films, including a lot more cycles of films, but this is this was the big uh, takeaway from Romer and from the Moral Tales. Um, these films, they emphasize character. And everything else is dictated by the character, both, uh, both the personality and the actions and choices. And that's, that will dictate the narrative. But these are not following any kind of story conventions. And the story, and if it does follow a story convention, it's, it's all, all its own. And this particular, this particular cycle of films, um, it looks at a, it looks at a man who is for whatever reason with one woman and he is presented with the possibility of pursuing another. Um, now, calling it the moral tales is a little bit deceptive. It's not, necess it's not necessarily a general morality he's talking about. What, he's interest what Romer was interested in these six cases is what a character how a character decides to do what he does, how a man decides to do what he does, and what is, what is the thought process, what are the, what are the values, um, what can he compromise on, uh, what can't he compromise on, is there anything that will tempt him to compromise on the things that he shouldn't. Um, and it's all not done to make a point. That's, that's the other deceptive thing about calling it the moral tales. It's not, it's not these aren't fables. They're not designed to be fables, but they, they're, they're more to showcase a reality that these people do exist in their own way. And when you, when you see the tales play out, you can, and this is, I think this is what's great about Romer is, is that he is, is that you are allowed to see the thought process. And even then, it's still a little bit elusive. So it's it's both revealing and also quite obscure. Now, this also... Now, because of this emphasis, because of, the, because of showcasing character and letting the characters be and not sort of telling them what to do, they, they just kind of be themselves and you see that, that provides a means of reflection. And that, I feel, is art... Uh, at its best, when it serves as a mirror. I've talked about this before, how art reflects back on you what is possible or what, or what one can do. And then the question you're left with is, do you continue doing this or do you, if, if you don't have a problem with it or if you do have a problem with it, how are you going to change it, how are you going to make better? This is what you get out of all six. And this is the other thing that I like about it, 
because this is a similar scenario or a similar um, a similar premise, it's all acted by different actors, or it's so not well, obviously different actors, but <laughs> there are different characters and there are different and there are different stories played out, and really become it it can also become a thing where you can pick your favorite and. That's probably why I won't spend too much time talking about each individual film because um, those who who have taken the time to to look at the the six moral tales uh, will come away with their particular favorites. Um, you know, some like uh, you know some really like uh, La Collection Nous, others uh, like My Not at Mods, and others like Claire's Knee, and and all for different reasons and. Since this whole thing is supposed to be more about my thoughts and impressions, um, I will, I will go through that. But nonetheless, I will do a service and try to cover each of the films as I can. So, um, on the one hand, it may be a bit on the long side, but on the other, I, I'll try to keep it reasonable. So, anyways, and just like with the BRD trilogy, these are presented in the order. Uh, according to author order, um, not necessarily in production order, and I'll point out where there's a there's a slight divergence. But anyway, the first tales, or actually, this is how the tales themselves are labeled, and it's presented in that order. It's presented in tales order. So, the first tale is called the Bakery Girl of Masio, and it's it was a it was made in 1962, and it's a short film. It's it's only um, 23 minutes and the scenario is a young law student who actually um, comes comes across this this woman um, on the street and is smitten and is smitten by her and kind of pursues her nowadays we, we call this stalking and that's arguable. That's a whole other. <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Um, but at any rate, and as he's as he's trying to find her and, and find out more about her, he ends up um, going to this particular bakery shop, and he ends up having this little ritual of, of buying cookies almost on a daily basis, and starts to. <clears throat> attract the attention of the bakery girl who works there and I think partly to amuse himself and to kind of kill time he wants to uh, plan this date with her and even though she's 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 sort of interested and sort of resists and um, um, it it almost works until the other woman shows up and then he can then he and then he goes with her, and, and um, even though she's 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 suspicious, they they somehow hit it off, and by the end of it, they're by the end of it, they're married, um, and they go to the same baker shop, but the girl is no longer there. So um, it's you know it's 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 not the very first film that Romer had made but it was uh but it was it was fairly kind of early in his career um there there's not my particular <laughs> favorite one so i guess i'll just kind of leave it at that but again this is what i like about the this is what i like about the tales tale number 2 is Suzanne's career and that was also made in 1963. In fact, they were they were made about both uh, the Bakery Girl of Monsio and Suzanne's career were made at the same time. And this also involves college students, uh, not necessarily law students, but um, the uh, the woman, the 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 central woman is someone who kind of captures the fa fancy of one of them, and, and he plays this really. Um, kind of nasty, seductive name where it kind of plays with her emotions. And he also finds out that she has money to spend, and so he kind of milks her out of it. And um, actually, I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's been, to be honest, it's been a while since I've seen all of them. And it's, um, 
the, you, you'll know which ones I really want to talk about. But, um, but with Suzanne's career, from what I remember, it, it's basically the big, the big come away there is that basically both guys, both guys were, end up being kind of assholes. Uh, and she ends up kind of getting the better of them in her own little way um, by kind of living her life and, and kind of going beyond their, uh, their judgments of her. I think that's how that works. I'm sorry I'm not doing the description justice. Uh, as you can tell, there's a lot to, to go through, so, um, so my apologies. But uh, then... Now, this one is a favorite of mine. This is tale number three, My Night at Mods. And this was made in 1969. And this is where it deviates from chronological order in terms of production. Now, in this tale, it's a young engineer who is practicing Catholic, but not in a overtly religious way. I think it's just something that he feels that it's important or he's 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 at a point where it it interests him and and occupies his, his attention in some respects but not not out of um i don't get the feeling of any kind of sincere piety that, at play but nonetheless it's there i think there are the, the principles are more important to him than anything else and um and one time he he attends mass and he and he sees this woman and he's convinced that she she's uh, she's going to potentially be his wife, and so he tries to meet her and she kind of goes away, um, but while he's there he bumps into an old friend of his, and it was it's one of those friendships where they where they meet each other and they seem to like pick up where they left off as far as conversation goes. And a lot of their conversations consist of philosophy. Uh, and particularly the, uh, the philosopher that they like to discuss the most is Blase Pascal. And, um, and this takes place around Christmas. And then on Christmas Eve, after, um, after attending Mass, these, these two, uh, they, um, he invites him to, to see a friend of his. Uh, a divorcee named Maud, and who works as a pediatrician, has a daughter, and is not particularly interested <laughs> in religion. Um, it's not antagonistic towards it, but just is not personally very interested in it. More of an agnostic. And basically they, they end up spending the whole evening together, and he leaves at a certain point, and he remains, and and the discussions is all about ideal woman and uh, about you know his ideal woman and uh what does it mean to live what is it what does it mean to live under god it's it's again it's all kind of philosophical <laughs> conversations um in the end he does um he does meet her um uh the woman whom he thinks uh should be his wife they do meet and um and what he what he finds out is that there there is a difference between ideal and reality, and that that and what the what your image of it shouldn't really matter. If you really love somebody, you should love them for who they are. And I think he learns that. <laughs> I like to think that he learns that. And I don't say this is because it it's. I mean, there is some there is some ambiguity into it. But again, this is part of the charm of the six moral tales where. There's, there's what they're, there's what they do, what they say, and what isn't said and done. It's that, it's that mysterious, unexplained factor that goes into play, and that's that's what makes that's what makes uh, his films and and in particular the Moral Tales uh, particularly interesting. Interesting. Um, again, this is this is my favorite of, of the Moral Tales. Um, initially because of the interests involved, um, because uh, religion is discussed, philosophy is discussed, um, ideals are discussed, and that provides a good basis to then think about other things. You know, you start with where the interest lies, and then you start building on it. 
and that's what makes it interesting. And this, I believe, was nominated for Best Original Screenplay. I'm talking about this as the Oscars are going on, even as we speak. And I believe this was also nominated for Best Foreign Film. I could be wrong on that. But um, at any rate, so, uh, so I'm not alone as far as liking it, too. And I think most people would say that My Night at Mods is probably the strongest of the moral tales. Uh, but then, then, of course, there's personal preference. So, anyway, moving right along. For tale number four is La Collectionus. And this was made in 1967. So this was made before My Night at Mods, but technically it's the fourth tale. And the characters here is a um, a bohemian slash art dealer and uh, his friend who's uh, who's an artist and they lounge about for a cup for a week or two at a friend's house they um, over in uh, Saint Tropez and while they're there there's a there's a woman who shows up um, who kind of lives her own life <laughs> and kind of doesn't give kind of doesn't give a damn about um, what anybody what anybody really thinks and this is one where um, there's there's a there's implied misogyny um, at play where you know she, she's constantly accused of as a slut but then at the same time, there's also some manipulations going that goes on that um, kind of plays into their own conceptions of it. And, and basically, it's, it's I think they're trying to get her to play their game. And she sort of sees past that and, and just ends up circumventing all of that. So um, anyway, it's not my particular favorite. <laughs> of them, so that's why this is good. It's going to get a brief mention. Tale number five is Claire's Knee. And that was made in 1970. Now this involves a... Now the other thing, that, the other interesting thing about the tales is that with each successive tale, the characters get slightly, are slightly older than the previous ones, which is probably why the tale order tends to matter a bit more. Uh, the first couple of tales are, involve people who are in their in their early 20s, more or less. Um, the next pair of tales are uh, people approaching their 30s, and then the next pair are, are those who are well into their 30s and are you know, more established. And so, it, and that alone can give you, uh, that can also influence the, the characters where they are at the stages of their life. And, the implication there's a there's a subtle implication that the younger you are the uh, more of a jerk you tend to be <laughs> in the way you do things and then as you get a little older you're a little bit more wiser it's it, you can still act like a jerk but it's not as um, it's not as hurtful as say the younger ones but anyways so Claire's knee um, a, it's a it's a diplomat who is uh, vacationing in um, in Switzerland in that sort of confusing area like near the near the the French Swiss border um, and he's he's staying there for a month or so before he goes before he uh, is is off to be married and he runs into an old friend, once lover of his, uh, who's also a writer, and what plays out is this, uh, she, he's, um, he meets this family that's in the process of, I want to say he's in the process of moving out, but I don't think that's quite it, but um, this, this, this family, they all get along, and, and there's two daughters, and one of them is comes off as wise beyond her, her years and um, somewhat of an Ed Jane Austen type, but also at the same time still comes off as 14 years old. Um, I know plenty of people like that. I myself was one of them, where 
we sound more we sound more smart we sound more mature than we actually end up acting you know we, you can't disguise you can't disguise the fact that we're we're still 14 and we don't know any better um, but the uh, but that's not the Claire there is a Claire and that's the other daughter and um, and actually the the thing for for the for the diplomat she he notices at one point he notices her knee and feels this compulsion to to touch it and he does he's not exactly sure why but he but he feels but he feels justified that if he does this then maybe it can get out his uh, his demons and curiosities and um, he tries once and it's a very very clumsy pass but then when he is successful it actually is less it becomes less a compulsion and more of a desire it ends up being um, fulfilling desire to um, show some compassion show some empathy in, in, a, in a trying time for her again it's kind of really hard to sum up succinctly what each of these tales are because again it's all these are all like moment by moments and they're and they're more realistic and the characters are more realistic and so it doesn't play out it doesn't play out to a particular goal and any goals that are there they're all set up by the characters and they either happen or they don't and that's due to other things that comes on so it's really hard to to summarize with any succinctness of what's going on but the fascinating thing is, is about it is you see this all play out in real time and, and you see the characters interact and you and again it provides a means of reflection and yes, I know about the famous critique about Rom about Romer, um, courtesy of Gene Hackman. He says, yeah, I've seen a Romer film once. It's kind of like watching paint dry. But I think it's a bit unfair. And anyway, the last tale, which is another favorite of mine, is um, number six, Love in the Afternoon. This was made in 1972. And when this was released in the United States, it was called Chloe in the Afternoon. I think it was to avoid confusion because there was another, there is another film called Love in the Afternoon. Um, and the character here is, um, is a, uh, I don't think he's a, I think he's a, I think he's a lawyer. Um, or a, like a, like a business attorney. And he's, He's married and has has a son and has and is expecting uh, is, 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 is expecting a daughter and has a pretty sort of very bourgeois life and um, but also has kind of his rituals and and there's even a moment where there's a, a little bit of a a little bit of a fantasy where he imagines that he has this device that takes away women's free will and allows and he can easily seduce them. The interesting thing is, is that most of the women that show up are, were women that show up in the other tales but this is not meant to be the same thing as a crossover. This is not this is not a moment where <clears throat> the characters of the other tales go into this one but they're all the same actresses so uh, it's a nice little nod to things past gone. But anyways but the thing that happens to him is he is um, a woman he knew shows up and is in as has has various issues and, and problems and and seeks his help and he doesn't quite provide it but then but then it begins a um, a casual friendship that does sort of border on an affair. It doesn't quite cross that line in any physically explicit way, but it it certainly teeters that line emotionally in some other respects. Um, and for a while, he's able to keep this division, and I think also for a while he enjoys it because of what it implies, but then also at the end he kind of realizes what the right thing to do or, or that he he comes to terms with himself and what he really wants and and so it ends up ends up not being ends up not being consummated so again the, the whole point of it is is not to point out a morality it's just to it's is to show 
is to illustrate a thought process is, is sort of the intent. And it's, and it's done through conversation. It's done through the mildest of actions, but it's also done through things that are not said and done. Again, it's, it's that what you say, what you do, and then there's everything else that's unknown to everybody, <laughs> including themselves. And this is what Romer was interested in. And, and I, and I, and I've heard this, this is the case with his other films, that this is something that he continued to explore. Not necessarily those particular scenarios, because I think that was its own cycle and that was, that was it. But in, in other cycles and other films, he was, he was interested in how characters live the lives that they do and the justifications that they do. And that is what makes it interesting, because... There's only so much that a conventional story can do. I mean, I mean, think about like take a take a genre like horror. Um, horror, the the main purpose of it is to is to scare you, is to come up, is to is to be unnerved by something that's so grotesque or alien or unusual or or threatening, and part of the, and the thrill of it is to to encounter it, discover it, know a little bit about it, and depending, and either um, vanquish the threat, especially if it is threatening, or come to terms with it, and then conquer some fears in that respect. There's only so much that you can do within a particular genre convention. And this is why I like cinema that try, that tries to break out of those conventions and and part of it is is not thinking about those conventions and going and emphasizing another element and by emphasizing that element you then go into other directions you go into other uh, places that you don't normally explore and that's that's what I got out of Romer and this this does explain to a to a certain extent why I wrote the films that I did and why I want to make them because they they are also in a sense character studies and they and these are all stories that were driven by the characters I think I am trying to make more of a point than Romer did with his but I certainly wanted to but certainly for me as far as creating them it did provide an avenue for me to explore um, other ideas or, or to explore the things that are certainly very interesting and are, and are worth exploring and it's done through the characters rather than just satisfy a convention. That's the other thing if you work right to a convention you spend most of your time trying to make sure that you have all the right elements and sometimes uh, it ends up coming off as very generic and very bland and very carbon copy whereas um, if you approach it more of a character thing, it feels a bit more fresh. I'm not saying that that's not always the case, and depending on what kind of characters you can create, it, ends, it may end up being just as formulaic and just as bland and uninspired and uninteresting as anything else. So it's, it's definitely not a foolproof way to come up with something interesting, but it is a way of... I think it is a way of finding something interesting, especially if you let it happen and not try to rein it in and control it. So, yes, of course I'm going to recommend it. This is actually a case where I I kind of wish that... Uh, this Criterion has done this with some of their box sets by separating out some of the titles and have it be standalones. They did this with the Cassavetes box set. Um, they did this with uh, Monterey Pop and um, they separated out the 400 blows from the Antoine de Winnell set, and it's, it's, it's a standalone. I kind of wonder if, if they're going to do it with this, and for that, I would, I would definitely recommend My Not at Mods. And if you're going to see at least one of them, I would, <clears throat> I would recommend uh, My Not at Mods more than anything. Um, it's, it's the most well-known of the moral tales, um, I th I think it's uh, it's it's the strongest of the six. It's it's easier to take. 
it is a personal favorite because it deals with things that are are interesting to me certainly and it also does showcase what I, I think it I think it best represents what Romer is about. I think there's a later film that probably does it better, but but you but you really can't go wrong. I think you can't go wrong with uh, My Night at Mods. But as far as the other tales, um, give them a spin. Just uh, and don't be ashamed if you don't like <laughs> certain ones, and don't be ashamed if you end up liking one like that is not typically liked. I mean, because there are some, I've, I've heard some praises on La Collection News, and I've heard other pr people praise Claire's Knee. And I've even, I think I've even heard some people praise uh, The Baker of Monsio and um, um, Suzanne's career. So, and, but that, that I think is a testament to the, the, the diversity of his characters. And, Different people speak to different people, and yeah, different people speak. You, you get along with certain people, and if you think about it in your own life, think of all the people you've met. Chances are there are, pe there are people that you like more than others, or you you feel com more comfortable talking with and associating with more than others. And I see this as the same thing that you know you feel you you may feel closer to the characters in La, Con La Connexion News or Love in the Afternoon than you do My Night at Mods, and vice versa. But, again, this is not... In the end, it's not a value judgment. I think it. I think for Romer... I think it's fair to say that for... Or maybe I would even say safe to say that for Romer, he has an affinity with all of them. Um, if for nothing else, that they were all his brain children. These are all uh, the result of his imagination. Um... And as well as some of the things that he was interested personally in exploring. So, no, it's not like watching paint dry. But I will say that if you're not used to character studies, if you're not used to that, it may be, it, it, it can be trying. But I really do think that you should give it a shot. And I, I do, and it, it is rewarding. If you think, if you approach it as, as a character, that this is a character playing out, I think I think you'll get a lot more out of it. You may end up not liking it, but at least you'll know why you don't like it. <laughs> and hopefully it'll be the reason that, oh, because I don't like the characters or oh, I don't like the choices that they make. Then I think you, you're getting something. But if you say that if you say that you didn't like it because, oh, it's not a it's not a fast paced story, then it's it's missing the point because that's, it wasn't constructed to fulfill a particular story or to fulfill a particular narrative convention it's really just to explore an idea through a character or explore a character through ideas and that's and so the, the narrative kind of takes a back seat in this respect so if, you, if you're if you're looking into it for narrative you're going to be disappointed because it's not quite there or if it's there it's not in an overt direct way as as saying other films. This is very much driven by character. And, and I know for me I'm I'm really interested in that. And I'm glad that I I'm glad that I got this set. Again, I'm sorry that I didn't spend too much time talking about in full detail about all the all the tales. And it is something that when I when I do occasionally go through the set, I don't make a habit of this because it is an extensive exercise in of itself. But it is something that um, I do get some other things out of it, and um, and while I do have my favorites, um, I, I've learned to like more of the tales more. Like for instance, I've I've learned to like Suzanne's career a bit more, um, and I've also learned to like Claire's knee. Claire's knee took me a while to to warm up to. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of collect La Collection News, and maybe it's just because of the the characters involved. They're they're kind of they're kind of all scummy anyway, but I think that's also sort of the point. But um, anyway, so it is something that you know, as you change and as you as you grow, you can your appreciation your appreciation of the moral tales also grows. So that's a lot. <laughs> you can understand. I mean, when you look at this, I mean, it's quite hefty. And also, in true Criterion fashion. There actually is the book with the actual tales. Because these were actually written before they were filmed. 
by Romer. And so basically he just kind of took them and formed them as the basis of the script. So, um, but yeah. Eric Romer's Six Moral Tales. And until next time, take care.